guys, welcome to this episode of the Jeshua D. Knoll podcast, wandering the desert with friends and having interesting conversations with interesting people. My guest today is Sean Matthews. He's been a creative professional for nearly three decades, working in music, marketing, branding, and PR. His latest endeavor is rehabbing and modernizing an old 70s recording studio in Springfield, Missouri, as well as shooting a documentary about the music maker revolution. How are you, Sean? I am awesome. I feel really good i'm sitting here at starbucks i'm not eating one of their uh, overpriced hot pockets <laughs> and I, I wouldn't recommend it wasn't good it uh, wasn't good i am ready i am ready for i'm ready to jump in i've listened to a couple of episodes of what you're doing and i feel like i have to really up my intellectual game today so <laughs> i'm going to try to use some uh, you know, polysyllabic words whenever I can. You just did. I, I don't even know what that means, I, man. I'm intimidated already. I think it means more than uh, one syllable. I believe. I don't know. So, <laughs> okay. Yeah. Well, that's that seems easy enough. I can try to use more than one syllable. <laughs> um. Okay. <laughs> okay. Sounds good. I don't. I don't. I don't know if you need to need to raise the level. I. I usually. Um, I just, I just kind of let it float around yeah. a little bit. Yeah. Uh, so you are at Starbucks right now. You're on your way. You're on your way to back to Springfield. I am. I live in Springfield, Missouri. I am, am from there. I, growing, I grew up there as a kid. And then my wife and I moved back there about, I don't know, uh, tw 2007. So 11 years ago. Okay. Um, I'm heading back from Virginia currently. I was in New York yesterday and I was interviewing somebody for this project that we will, I'm sure, talk about at some point. Um, and uh, yeah, so I'm just, I'm here on the road and we had the date scheduled and I was like really excited. So I pulled over and kind of pulled my notes together and, and here we are. I appreciate that, man. You you are are a busy, busy man right now. You know, you were in Nashville. Like, was it just like a week ago? I in the that? last. So this is my. Well, so I've been going out to Virginia on kind of not so happy. I've been trying to turn uh, you know negatives into positives. Uh, my the house that I grew up in uh, when I was like fourteen through like seventeen or eighteen. Um, my grandma's house in Arlington, Virginia, my aunt was living there and my aunt recently passed away. So I've been having to go back and help, you know, clean out the estate for the family. So in between okay. rehabbing the studio that started at the beginning of April, I have over the last three months basically spent, uh, five trips, almost a month and a half out here in Virginia working on this house as well. So it's, uh, you know, it's, I, I, I think busy is an accurate word. I've been, I basically will do a week and a half out on the East coast and then come back and do, you know, some, some rehab, like, you know, we'll, we'll build a fence or we'll put a sidewalk in or do some painting or whatever. And when that project's done, I'll kind of like leave my wife there to manage the studio property. And then I will head back across the East coast or over to the East coast to, um, you know, but because of that, I, I've been driving, so I'll take different routes. So last week I was in Nashville, the time before, you know, I was in Atlanta and Memphis. And the time before that, I went up north. Um, right. So that's you, know, you like in making the trip a little bit more enjoyable. I try to bring, I don't go, you know, absolutely crazy. But my background is like, I used to play in bands. So I think we calculated in one six month period that I was, I was managing this artist and we figured out that in a six month period, we, we had driven close to 50,000 miles in like six months. So the, That's crazy. the open roads of the United States are no, I'm no stranger to. Right. That see that also, I also find that intimidating. Uh, is it, so you're talking 50,000 miles in like a, not, not to focus in the past, but, but in like a tour van, like some kind of, like it was actually a, a one of those oh, what was it a dodge caravan it was a silver dodge caravan <laughs> that on my wow. this is a great story actually uh i'm ready on on my grandfather's deathbed he basically you know turns to my uncle and says i want you to have the i want you to have the the caravan or whatever it is you know and my mm -hmm. uncle's like gee thanks dad and we literally like walk outside 
and my uncle goes, that thing's like from 1986. I don't <laughs> want that thing. And I, I was like, I'll buy it off you for a dollar. And he goes, okay. So I pull a dollar out of my pocket, which I found out later on is technically illegal in the state of Missouri. You have to sell. That's illegal? Yeah, you have to sell a uh, car. There's like a minimum value that you have to sell a car for. I think it's like $250 or something like that. But I'm sure we've passed the statute of limitations if the state of Missouri is listening to, to us right now. <laughs> this was 2008 yeah, or not. I'm sure, I'm sure it's okay. Yeah. You, you get a knock at the Starbucks door. Yeah. <laughs> They're listening to this right now live. Well, this guy just pulled up, so it's kind of kind of weird timing that you said Oh, that. Is, he, is it another van? It is. is it a he's, car van? He's in, he's in a van. No, so, and what was funny was we drew, so we left Springfield, and like a couple of days later, we're out on tour, and we're, like I said, driving all over the place. We, you know, went across the country like a couple of times in this van and did a couple of tours and by the end of it because again remember i paid a dollar for this van by the end of it this thing was just it was held together with like a wish and duct tape it was (laughs) completely just destroyed and so it didn't break down on the way to a show or something we never broke i blew a tire one time and so my artist had to jump he was a guy named andy ziff out of dc uh z-i-p-f for your listeners and he was incredible voice incredible talent and uh we were on tour with another friend of ours and we broke we blew a i blew a tire in montana had to pull over to the side of the road he jumps in the other car and then I basically had to spend a whole, I lost a day. So they were a day ahead of me for like, you know, a couple of days, like where I'm trying right. to catch up with them. Cause it's just, it's like such vast country up there. Um, yeah, for sure. You know, and they had two drivers so they could drive farther than I could and all that. But again, these are the stories of the past. Let's talk about something present. Let's let, let's do that. I'm excited to do that just because uh, the words music maker revolution. That's, that's, that's exciting. That sounds exciting. What is the music maker revolution? Okay. So I, I've been doing, I've been involved with me when I started in 19, I think it was like 89. I graduated high school and um, that's 1989, not 1889. So when I graduated high school, I, I got a job at, as a uh, intern at a recording studio in Northern Virginia. And I was completely just immediately enamored with like the whole recording process. And I knew for like, it was, it was like written in the stars, I guess, that I was going to own a recording studio one day. And I've actually over the years attempted to do what I'm doing now, like four times. And so during that process, I, like I said, I've played in bands, I've managed artists, I've helped develop artists, I've been a songwriter, producer, et cetera, et cetera. And right. so I've seen this 30 year arc of how, you know, I remember the big, li- when they talk about in the music industry, and I know that, I know for your listeners, like you're, this isn't the usual subject matter that you cover on your show, but I really feel like there's people will relate to this because we've seen so much of this uh, in, in our, in pop culture, like recently there, this is going on, like the stuff that I'm talking about. So it's like the revolution. Yeah. The revolution. Like, so you see all the, you know, I've seen the days of analog tape and analog recording and actually working in studios where we were recording to analog tape and that, would be pressed onto vinyl and CDs and all that. And so then fast forward to digital recording and downloads and right. I mean, and here's my SoundCloud link. Exactly. And I have seen the entire going back to that guy, Andy Ziff. I, I, we were doing in 2004, 2005, we were doing like these download cards that we would basically sell at shows with a t-shirt. And it was really like, it wasn't before people were doing it, but we, we were like, okay, well, the CD's dead. So what's next? It's going to be these downloads and we're going to do. And Andy and I did a lot of like really interesting. I mean, we had crowdfunded his entire 
second album before like three years before kickstarter was even a thing so we had How gone did you the outreach um we just we it was it was kind of old old fashioned but we were going you know knocking knocking on the doors of fans essentially right so we were going nice. to all of our fans we'd either email them we would uh we talked to some investors we talked to some you know basically friends family uh who, fans whoever we could get to and some people gave three dollars some people gave more but it wasn't until a couple of years later that we figured we found out that this was called crowdfunding we were just using his fan base um we did this thing called the three dollar or the two dollar tour and it was basically the tickets were it, it was two it was two dollars at the show so wherever he played it was two dollars but then we would mm -hmm. also ask fans of you know his fans online like at the time i believe it was right at the beginning of it was myspace essentially so we'd ask people on myspace hey uh will you throw in two dollars to help fund this tour and so people we, we not only did we get two dollars at each of the shows from people that were showing up but we were also getting people just because they like the idea throwing in two dollars to support this guy to go out and tour around you know right because it's, a, it's a new idea it's a new idea and we've i've always been pretty good at jumping in i realize i haven't answered your music maker qu question yet but i'm gonna get to i it. feel like um, we're, we're getting there it's a little backstory for the you know this is the theater of the mind i'm painting a picture for the audience uh yeah so, absolutely it's vivid so basically you know um we we were doing all this stuff before we were we were noticing the trends we were selling these download cards we were crowdfunding before crowdfunding was a thing we were uh really being innovative but the problem was the market wasn't developed at that point. We're talking 2007, 2008 at this point. Um, right. And so Instagram wasn't a thing. Uh, Spotify wasn't a thing. Like all of these things that we kind of take for granted in 2018, these are still only, you know, six or seven. They're not that old, you know. So Right. But I have seen the entire... Uh, I would say from from LP, you know, vinyl and CDs all the way to, you know, people, people like these Instagram stories with the Spotify link. You know, we're using we're trying to figure out ways to use all of that. And so during this process over the last couple of years, um, as I knew that I was either going to buy or build a studio, a recording studio. I I started noticing, wow, there's an amazing, this might be the most exciting time I've ever seen in music because it is no longer owned by these big corporations saying, you have to do this, you have to do that. It's literally in the hands of the people. And if somebody, if somebody loves what you're like, if let's say, for instance, you play, uh, you play banjo with like a, uh, a beatbox or something like that, right? That's my dream. Right. Who who it would be everybody's dream. I think in the audience right now, everyone is saying, <laughs> I would I would go and see that. But I mean, so I so. so let's say that that's your deal, right? Well, right. it used to be that you would take that to a record company, and unless they could instantly see the hit potential of that, there's no way that anybody's gonna invest hundreds of thousands to millions of dollars to put you on tour and to develop the the that act or that brand or whatever you want to call it into a viable product because it's just too risky they're going to go with the thing that is easy that is tried and true and all of that right so right. so when i say music maker revolution you start looking at this isn't just people making music uh, per se. Like this isn't just about hip hop or EDM or singer songwriters or bands. This goes further than that. This goes into the people that are making custom instruments for said bands, uh, you know, rappers, whatever. I mean, so it's like, and then 
beyond that is like there's people making custom parts for the custom guitar makers for you right. know so they, it's like uh i find that fascinating i find this uh this level of this granular level of again like that whole maker movement and the whole musician movement kind of being melded together and I think it's really amazing. And so, absolutely. So again, for me, having this thirty-year dream of wanting to go from starting, you know, starting off in a recording studio, saying I wanted to buy a building, I wanted to buy the equipment, I wanted to start a studio, and it would have cost, you know, thirty years ago, that would have been a two point five million dollar investment. When you think about how expensive the equipment was, how expensive real estate would have cost to do the build out and all. I mean, it was, it was a pretty expensive endeavor. And I know that people listening might say, you know, well, you could probably do it cheaper if you did this, but I mean, I've just in, in Falls Church, Virginia at the time, that's roughly what it would have cost to um, do it right. You know, to do it right the way that I wanted to do it. So fast forward 30 years where uh, the, the thing that I say in the documentary that we're working on, it's like, when everybody else ha and it seems like everybody else in the world right now is like tearing down these old recording studios my wife and i decided to buy one you know like we decided to these are really special buildings that were created for the purpose of creating and it's like you wouldn't think about tearing down the louvre or right. like these these places of culture to to build a starbucks that sells overpriced hot pockets to go back to that <laughs> yeah yeah absolutely and the creative process the process of creating this music looks radically different now than it did then but it's still a process and it still needs room to happen and if you want to do it professionally i mean you need equipment you need a space to do it and then like you said there's the historical value yeah and, and the thing is like i know a 20 i know a 20 year old is sitting there listening to this now going well i can open up my laptop and create a song and i don't ever have to step foot in a studio and i say absolutely true and i love that freedom i exercise that same freedom almost on a daily basis but what that what that younger guy or girl may not know is they've never if they've never stepped foot into a recording studio where you have people around that are literally trying to get the best work out of you. It's like this, it's an alchemy of the room and the space and the people in the space and the equipment. It's, it's not just one thing. And right. so it's like part of what I feel like I'm, I'm called to do is I'm like this custodian of all this information that I've learned over the past 30 years. And I desperately want to teach it to the next generation. I want to pass that on. So these things, even if they're not used, I don't use a lot of this stuff every day, but I know it. And I feel like it should be passed on to the next generation so they can take it and kind of morph it into whatever their workflow is and adapt some of those process. Cause there's this craft that has been lost over the past uh, you know, with everybody being able to work in a coffee shop or their dorm room or their bedroom or whatever it is, mm -hmm. there's this process of craft that has been lost. And I think that if I can help restore some of that, like even if people come in and work with me one time, I teach them some tricks and then they continue to work in their you know, on their laptop in their home studio or whatever, I still think it's going to change their outlook for the positive, you know? Right. It's a new experience. It's, right. I, I hadn't, I hadn't, I honestly hadn't thought about like the, uh, the starkness of the contrast between what it really means to make a song on a laptop and what it means to go into a studio as far as being surrounded by people who are trying to get the best sound out of what you're doing. It's the difference between having a treadmill in your home and being a professional athlete with like a team of people working with you to try to get the best performance out of you. Exactly. It's, yeah. And, and I, I mean, that's if, incredible. if you think about it, it's like everyone needs an editor. You know, everyone needs somebody, whether sometimes it's your wife, your girlfriend, your boyfriend, 
sometimes it's your mom or dad. Sometimes it's like, uh, you know, somebody at work. But some, right. you always need someone to look at what you're doing from an outside perspective and say, man, that is so cool. What if you did dot, dot, dot? You know, right. That is there's things you won't think of. You're going to end up either thinking it's way better than it is or way worse than it is. And you're not going to have anyone to tell you different. Right. Who knows you personally. Right. And I mean, like, you know, who knows how many amazing songs have been scrapped by people out there in the audience who have worked on something and just said, ah, oh, this is no good. And they've like deleted the file and it could have been amazing but because they didn't have that other person saying oh my gosh that is a what is that that's killer dude like right right i mean it's like or like you said it's like wow that is the i i don't know if you want people to hear that like i'm your friend but you may not want people to hear that you know what i mean it's like yeah you avoid the embarrassment right. only by making it better right or making something new that's better right and then um, beyond that, it's like there is, again, I go back to the word alchemy because I really think that there's this amazing process that happens when you work with, even if it's a handful of people, two or three people, and you're making, again, like hip hop beats or whatever. Uh, there's just something magical that happens when you have two or three people in the room that are focused on the same thing that are all focused on making whatever it is you're doing better or the best that it can be and you it's like your your brain waves change your and there's a whole science behind this that I'm not, I'm not able to explain I am going to as part of the documentary I want to I want to talk about like the scientific process of what's happening when you pull two or three people together, because I know it happens because I've seen it over and over. It's like, there's, right. there's this thing that happens where it's like, at first it's awkward, then it's like tense. And then everybody kind of like settles in. Then you get into a groove, you get into what some people call a flow state. And it just becomes like this, it, when it's working and sometimes it just doesn't work and you're like, all right, we need to, we need to end this session now, but when it's working, it is gold. Absolutely. And, and I challenge, I'm not saying that you can't be creative as a lone ranger off in your bedroom or recording studio or whatever, working by yourself. All I'm saying is I know that, different things happen when you work with other people. That's yeah. all I'm saying. It's not yeah. a one's better or the work, you know, it's not that they're game. different experiences. And, right. and if you're, and if you're going to create things consistently, if you want to be a versatile artist, it's important to have different kinds of experiences under your belt. I think too, like, even if we, neither of us can explain the psychology behind it, I think almost everyone listening, anyone listening who's worked on a project with some other person that they cared about, yeah. Um, knows what we're talking about. Yeah. Know what you're describing. Yeah, because I mean, like, it there's just a vibe that happens when you're working on something that is important to you. I mean, it could be as simple as you know, making a a, a planter box for your garden or something. It can be as simple as that, where it's right. like you're you gonna take breakfast together. Yeah, that yeah, exactly. Like going and having breakfast and like doing something intentional, like, hey, we're going to meet on Saturday morning at, you know, IHOP on downtown or whatever it is, and we're going to go down there and meet, and we're just going to hang out because we haven't hung out for a year, and we just need to talk and catch up and all of that. That intentionality that happens, and when you do that, there's just something because you said, I'm going to do this, and then you actually take action on that, there's something very powerful about that. Yeah, absolutely. I think that also, um, like when you're working alone on a laptop, whether on any kind of project, but especially with something artistic um, or distinctly artistic like music or uh, digital painting or anything like that, it can get lonely in the sense that not only do you not have someone to collaborate with, uh, some kind of editor, but if you don't know how to market your stuff online, 
it can, it can be hard for some, for you to find an audience, very hard because everyone's creating something, not everyone, but there's so much content online in every field, in every genre. If you don't know how to connect with people, it's going to be really, really hard. Your band cam's going to get buried or whatever. Yeah. You know? Well, so just having other people in your life who know what you're doing uh, can be fundamental for people, but they might not have that access because they've kind of isolated themselves in a, this is my project kind of mindset where they don't really share it with others. Um, at least not intentionally, you yeah. know, even if that's what they're trying to do. Yeah. Well, you hit on, you hit on a couple of things there. I mean, so I've been fortunate enough. I've basically been self-employed for almost 30 years where I've been working for myself saying, I want to go do this. And the way that I, I mean, the way that I explain it to most people is like, I have an idea. I write it down on a piece of paper and then I convince somebody else that it's a good idea and to help me fund that idea. So that could be through, I'm going to do a social activation uh, you know, we're going to do, we did a cross country scavenger hunt for eHarmony, the dating website thing. We did a cross country scavenger hunt when, um, when, what was it? Periscope came out the live streaming app, you know? Yeah. We had done this, we had done this social media activation for them. Um, so I've been doing and, and, you know, writing songs, going to a publishing company and saying, Hey, I've got this group of songs and they exchange money to me for ownership of the song, like part of the songs. And then I can write more songs and I can make demos and all of that. Right. So I've so, been, I've been doing that for 30 years and it's like, I get overwhelmed by the amount of stuff that is, it's like, how is anybody ever going to find, you know, I keep talking about this documentary that I'm making. It's like, how is anybody even going to find this thing? There's so many documentaries about music and, you know, how am I going to stand out in the crowd? But, and that's something after doing this for three decades, I struggle with. So like, what is it, you know, somebody who's like 16 or 17, who's just getting started, like, I can't even imagine what that feels like. I used to, I used to own an online shoe company. Trust me. It doesn't feel it's, it's overwhelming. It's yeah. overwhelming. Yeah. Um, yeah, for sure. I forgot what I was going to say. I was going to ask you about, okay. So not only have you worked in music for 30 years or uh, 25 plus around 30 years. It's uh, like, I I'm trying to figure it out. So I just say almost three decades. That's how, almost three decades. I like that. That sounds, it sounds nice. It's, but it's it's funny because I I don't it's like I don't feel disconnected from the culture that's I feel more connected now than when I was eighteen, which is really weird because you kept doing it though. Yeah, that makes sense. and I stayed busy, and I surround myself with people that are younger that have different perspectives and different ideas and. You, you know what I mean? It's like they look mm -hmm. at the world differently, which helps me to look at the world differently, which helps me as a create. One of the things that as a creative professional, and this is like something I would say to basically anybody under the age of 30, that is. And, and when I say creative professional, that's just the fastest way I've been able to explain like because I've done so many different, I've worn so many different hats. It's I've taken, you know, photos for magazines. I have written movie scripts. I, you know what I'm saying? It's like, yeah. when you try to like, when people say, well, what do you do? I just say, I'm a creative professional. And they go, well, what does that mean? It's like, I get people to pay me money for ideas. And they go, like what? And then, you know what I mean? It's like, yes, it's, but that explanation is key though. I, yeah. I get people to pay me money for ideas because that, is a description and it's just vague enough that you can start a conversation or people can just say, Oh, but when you say creative professional, I mean, um, it can sound like a buzzword almost, I yeah. think to some people. So having that, that little explanation that just said that it kind of just explains it a little bit, yeah. I think is, is foundational yeah. uh, for having a conversation about what you actually do and, you know, and sharing ideas with people and about what that looks like. Well, it's also highly contextual because if I'm, if I'm like at a, if I'm at something like South by Southwest down in Austin, I usually go down for like the interactive portion. So if I'm in mm -hmm. that context and there's a ton of startups, 
it's like, oh yeah, you know, I do branding and more. I'm a creative professional. I, what does that mean? Oh, you know, I, I basically create these social media. So it, I'll, I'll nuance it a little bit more and say, I create social campaigns for startups or I'll usually say, cause it's true. I work with everybody from startups to billion dollar brands and they go, Oh, what brands have you worked with? And then I say, I work with Wikipedia, Upwork, oh, you know, uh, eHarmony, O'Reilly Auto Parts, yada, yada, yada. And oh, the jingle like, stuck in my head already. <laughs> you know, and they're like, how did you do that? And I'm like, well, you know, I explained the story, but if I'm in a music context, like if I'm in Nashville or something, then I switch, the, I, I switch my hat and I talk about, well, I'm rehabbing the studio right now. I'm in the process of, but it all works together. And it's like, right. that was like the other point that I was going to make earlier. Um, you know, not only is the field cluttered, but it's very, very hard to create your, create an identity and a strong brand. And the one thing that the one thing that I I try to tell people is like just pick one thing. Um, if you're good at a bunch of things, like that's cool. But just talk about one thing at a time because mm -hmm. people can't wrap their head around, you know. Well, what does this what does this guy do? You know, and so it's right. like people it, don't successful people don't do a million things at once. They do one thing really, really well, and then when that project is finished, they move on to the next thing. And maybe they have a fan base, maybe they have a following now who will follow them to the next project. Right, right. And so, like in this context, it's like I keep saying, you know, I'm working on this documentary, I'm building this recording studio or rehabbing this recording studio. It's like those two things are interconnected and it's a it's a lot simpler to understand well you know even if you have questions like well i don't fully understand it's like if if i was talking about that and then saying and i'm talking this is all from personal experience because i used to do this all the time it's like well i'm also working on this you know uh ur urban farming project or whatever it is well, like something else that i was interested in, and i would talk about all these things and so by the time that i was done with the conversation we had covered 20 different topics and they're like, I don't know what this guy does. Like, what is this, <laughs> you know, which makes right. it very hard for somebody to turn around and say, I really like this dude. I don't know how I would work with him though, because I don't know what he does. And yeah, so, you have to try to know a little bit about what they do. If you want to build a bridge there, right. You right. know what, what to mention. Um, cause we identify so much with what we do and we identify others with what they do. Like you meet someone, one of the first questions they might ask you is, is what do you do? You know, what's your, what's your job? Do you go to school? If maybe if you're younger, they'll ask you that question. And like, that's, that's your, uh, first identity, let's yeah. say yeah. they have for you. And ultimately that interaction is completely selfish on the part of whoever you're meeting. It's like <laughs> when you, I mean, yeah. it is, it's like, so what do you do? Uh, I'm a, I'm a, I'm an accountant. It's like, well, if you're 20 years old, you're like, okay, that's cool. You're an accountant. But if they're like, if you're 40 and you need an accountant, you're like, oh, really? We were just thinking about switching accountants. So yeah, it, tell me, you know what, what I mean? You, right. What do you do is, is how might you be able to help me? Right. And sometimes, sometimes it's, what do you do? Because I want to tell you what I do. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> Which is, which is like 10 times more, uh, more selfish, maybe. Right. Which is basically <laughs> the whole context of like why we're even talking right now. I mean, that's, that's essentially yeah. like, you know, we're bringing value to each other. I need a platform to talk to people and you need a guest to, and it's not bad. It's like that. It's is not bad. The, the immediate, how I think of this, this podcast and, and why I started it is because I really enjoy learning and I enjoy having conversations with people though I can be, um, kind of timid at times in person. I really enjoy learning. So this is an excuse for me to learn from as many people as possible oh, and to provide value to listeners in the process. Yeah, so it's absolutely, that's a, that's a selfish intention almost. Cause I just want to, I'm here to listen. I'm here to learn, yeah. you know, absolutely brilliant though. I mean, so I like, again, just going back to, I always want to leave. I always want to talk to people as if I'm sitting there in the room with them. And if I could, you know, kind of, say something directly to 
you know, your listeners, it's, it's, I just want to convey like, A, this can be done. You can have a career where it's like, it doesn't look like what everybody else is saying. You know, I need to go to college and then go get this degree and all of that stuff. That's important for some things. And I'm not discounting that, but it's like, that path is not for everybody. And when I started this, there was no path to do what I'm doing now. Now it's called like a creative director or head of marketing or, you know, there's all these titles in all these different companies that literally only existed in a few places, like on Madison Avenue for advertising. There was a creative director, but you had to move to New York or a city that had a big advertising agency and you could be a creative director, but there was like, I don't know, a hundred jobs in the, in the world at that point that were, I mean, you know, it's a finite number because there was only so many advertising agencies and they were in specific places. So to be a creative director 30 years ago meant I'm moving to one of these big cities and working at an advertising agency where they might have 1500 people and I've got to work my way all the way up to the point where I'm a creative director or the head of, right. you know what I'm saying? And it's like, now you can be at a startup that you're making a, a good living, uh, you know, as a quote unquote creative director or some equivalent. And your job is to come up with, you know, head of head of marketing or director of marketing or whatever. And your job is to come up with cool ways to get attention for your products or right. whatever, you're, you know. Yeah, at least um, at least in the music industry, a lot of that is, you know, you've cut out the middleman of, of giant record labels, at least in the sense that they don't they don't decide the market anymore. Yeah, they don't decide who does and doesn't make it. Not to say that somebody has to fill that vacuum because that's not what's happening, but people need to know how to do it themselves. People right. need to know how to build an identity online to build a brand. Uh, artist development, I think, is the professional term. Yes. Or is it yes. Yeah. Okay, cool. Well, and so uh, that's like, I'm, I'm going to just jump in here because like that's, it's not for us, it's not just about like with this, with this building that we're working on, that it's this old 70s studio uh, it was built in the 1970s in Springfield, Missouri. It has this crazy history to it. Like we've, we've been adding up the artists who have worked in there, like the amount of records that they've sold, like actual, you know, physical sales. And it's well over 10 million at this point. You know, it's wow. like, it's just crazy, right? Um, yeah, absolutely crazy. But it's like, yeah, that's cool that all this stuff happened. But exactly like what we were talking about earlier of how is that relevant to what I'm doing? How does that help me? And one of the things that we're really, really interested in is artist development, but not just like for musicians necessarily, because that's very one dimensional. It's like, I'm not just, I'm looking at this building as more of like a creative lab of how do we train the next generation of talent for not just mu music, but graphic design or social media. And it's like, there's programs out there and all of that. But I mean, like everyone who ever works for me does real stuff from day one. It's not like a theoretical campaign, like, Hey, we're going to do this class project where we do X, Y, and Z. It's, right. Or buy my online course. Right. It's like, Hey, I'm going to pay you to do this thing and you're going to learn a ton and you're going to be completely overwhelmed. Uh, that's okay because we're all overwhelmed. We're going to figure it out together. But right. everyone who's working for me or working with me is always learning because they're, they're having to, it's like, Hey, I don't know how to do, I don't know how to do Instagram stories. Like go on, watch 20 YouTube videos about Instagram stories, come back tell me what we need to do. We're going to figure out a strategy and then we're going to go. It's not like it takes six months. It's like six hours later, we're implementing an Instagram story strategy or whatever. You right. know what I'm saying? Yes. And when, when you're overwhelmed, especially 
um, getting into that flow, a lot of what that looks like is having people to hold you accountable. Because if you're researching Instagram stories, you don't know how to get involved in it. You don't know how to build a strategy for that. And you're just overwhelmed by the idea of it. Odds are you're just going to, you're going to put it off. Yeah. If, if no one else, if you're not extremely self-motivated, you're going to put it off because it's not what you're familiar with. Yeah. And, it, but because I have this, I mean, it's just, it's really just age and experience and practice because I've been doing this for 30 years. It's like, I stories, uh, it's just another channel, another, uh, you know, it's another uh, paint or brush in my artist palette, right? It's like, right. I can use this color. I can use this red color instead of this blue color because this red color evokes a different feeling than blue does. And so I'm going to use red, but they're the exact, I mean, they're both paint They're you know, and so it's with, with Instagram stories or Snapchat or musically or any of these platforms, I just look at them as another channel and I have to understand what is that channel doing and who is it reaching? What are they, why, what is their value that they're getting from it? You know, uh, yeah. with well, that's the entrepreneurial spirit right there is finding, finding the needs, finding what people in that, in that niche, uh, want out of the platform. Yeah. Yeah. And then figuring out how do we connect whatever project we're doing to whatever the market is wanting or needing, you know? And so going back to your original question with, the the music maker revolution i've been uh i love instagram i think it's it's incredible that you can quickly find like-minded people in the hundreds of thousands not just like a few it's, it's like, like 800,000 isn't it something it's something there. crazy i can't remember there's there's a couple of different hashtags that i like music makers just because i feel like that's I'm trying to figure out like the best term. And, and to me, that's the, that's the best hashtag that I've found that seems to be the most inclusive because you could be a guitar manufacturer and you are a music maker. You could be a beat maker and you're a music maker. You could be a singer and you're a music maker. Right. You could be a, an accordion player and you're a music maker. Because to me, this whole idea of the, music maker revolution is really about the democratization of this and the ability to carve out something unique and through YouTube and Instagram and Patreon and Spotify and all of these things, you're probably not going to be rich from doing all those things, but you can certainly, you can certainly create a good living. And it's like, I tell people, you know, would you rather, and I'm not, I'm not saying this is good or bad or whatever. I'm just saying like, if you're somebody who's like always wanted to be a photographer, would you rather be a photographer who's making their rent and, and paying for food and gas and all of that doing photography? Or would you rather be working at Starbucks and then paying your bills by working at Starbucks and doing photography on the weekends. Most right. creative people that I know would like to be making money from what they're doing and, and just do that, you know, and that's possible if you have a strategy, if you work hard, if you have an end game, if you are using all of these channels correctly, if you're, you know, and so that goes back to this recording studio, we're creating like this creative facility that yes, it's half recording studio and then half almost uh, prototyping lab, creative lab, um, a way to take an idea from, you know, a piece of paper to how do we actually get this made and put out there? How do we, you know what I'm saying? It's, it's, yes. so it's, it's going way beyond just music because all these things are interrelated. So it's like, if I create like a backpack that I can put on a really cool artist that we're promoting and that artist or that we're developing and that artist is blowing up and I've got these two other product designers that are making a backpack and we say, hey, 
put this backpack on, like, you know, or whatever it is, or put this t-shirt on and like use it in the video. Uh, it's like, they're all interrelated. So it's like, and then, and then I can go outside and say, Hey, you know, I've got these three female artists that are like doing really well. I can go to a, a clean makeup company that's making like, you know, organic, uh, vegan, whatever it is, whatever the demographic is that we're targeting and say, I've got these three female artists that are totally in line with all your value pro or your, your, your company values and like the product fit and all of that. How about we do uh we do a project together and it's a no brainer. We've got like a hundred thousand followers for these three female artists and the, uh, makeup brand has money that they're spending on advertising and now we put those two together and literally everyone is happy it's right like, so, so i'm thinking next level stuff like how do we do that kind of stuff yeah that's awesome um seeing or hearing that you've not just worked in the music industry for uh what, what did you say about three decades that's how i should say it i would say close to three decades close to three decades i not had the first linear, word wrong you know? i had the first word wrong close yeah. to three decades um but you were in a position where you were pitching ideas and you were pitching uh, songs to institutions, to record labels, to companies, and you had some successes and I'm sure some non-successes in that time. You've seen that, you've experienced that, and now you are, you have adapted, you're experiencing uh, the cultural revolution, the music maker revolution, the the decentralization of it all. And yeah. instead of, and you're, you're, you're renovating this studio from the seventies, but it's a project. So huh. I also find it admirable that you don't want to talk about the past a lot. You don't want to talk about the history uh, of the studio as in this context, at least as much as you want to talk about what you're going to do with it and how it's not just that you're renovating the studio as a, for the historical uh, element of it, but you're making something entirely new. You're not opposing the music maker revolution, you are fully ingrained in it and you are trying to find these people who are taking advantage of this new, uh, this, this new order or this new disorder even, um, and help them and teach them how to really hone their skills and to polish things up a little bit more and how to, um, reach new, new people on new platforms and connect with, uh, people and brands and companies that wouldn't have been able to otherwise. Yep. And I, that's what I find really fascinating about this is there is, almost zero nostalgia when we talk about this project. It's all, I want to do something entirely new with what's been here for a long time. Yeah, and, and, and you know, it's like, I'll push back just a little bit on that. The, the documentary that we're creating is, I'm talking about some of that past because it is important. The studio wouldn't right. even be there if it wasn't for the past. However, I feel like, you know, teaching a history lesson with no context for why it's important now is just a waste of everybody's time. It's like, yeah, absolutely. If, if I can't now, what I am trying to do with all of the people and I, 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 I'm, I could go through like all the different artists that have recorded there and say, here's how this is relevant to you right now. Young artist, like they went out and, uh, they were touring for two years nonstop before anybody paid attention to them. They were going out and they were playing at barns and they are playing at motels and supermarket openings and whatever. It's like they were hustling before anybody ever paid attention to them. And then when they did X, Y, and Z, somebody noticed them and their career started to take off. That is relevant right now. It's like, that's what you can't wait around for this perfect song or this perfect piece of, you know, you mentioned digital painting. It's like, nothing is ever going to be right. It is always going to be like right now. Like this is, this is as good as it's going to be right now. I'm going to put this out and people are going to either love it or hate it. If they hate it, I'm going to learn from why they hate it, and I'm going to do it again until they love it. That mm-hmm. is the that is like the key. It's tenacity and going. 
I've got to just keep moving forward, you know? So it's there. I, I am very nostalgic and very, I mean, I could literally, we could do three more podcasts. And I could tell you stories of the history of the studio and my family's history with Springfield and uh, how cool Springfield used to be back in the sixties. And it was literally a creative hub for musicians and people around the music industry. I'm, I'm deeply passionate about that. However, it's not relevant to our conversation. It's not relevant to your audience. And if it is, then they need to watch the documentary because that'll right. be covered or they need to like, you know, uh, there, there'll be, we'll be putting together podcasts as we're creating these episodes and stuff like that of, Hey, if you really want to know about this subject, like we're diving deep into it, but mm -hmm. I don't want to be, I don't want to be so focused on the past that I just become irrelevant, you know, like, and that's, that's the problem with a lot of people that I meet. Um, that happens with a lot of older artists. Right. Because it's like, now, obviously if I had like five hits, right. If I had five hits, I can't go out and not play my five hits because that just makes people angry. When you, when you, yeah, you know, yeah, you I went, pay. I went, to a, I went to a Foo Fighters show uh, in, in Memphis recently, and and I mean, you you can tell when people are just waiting for those five songs, man. Yeah, yeah, and and it's like if they don't play them, the audience is like, "Look, I paid seventy five dollars for this show. I, you know, I've been saving up for like two weeks to come to this show. If you don't play those hits." It, you're just it's it's just not fair to the audience you know so it's like i get that but like every every artist that is a credible artist knows how to play the hits but to create music that is relevant i feel like david bowie was probably the the best example of that where he continually over the decades because you're talking to, about somebody that had like a 40 year or, or like a 40 four decade career and he was relevant at some point in every decade you know right have you listened to his his oldest stuff oh yeah it is eerie sometimes yeah i love it but it is eerie yeah i mean it's it's really interesting he he was like one of those artists that knew how to consistently adapt to make allies with whoever was like the most current he did in the 90s with nine inch nails like instead of like pitting himself up as these guys are a competitor to what i'm doing he made allies he's like we're gonna do a collaboration together i mean he was like doing that throughout his career and you see that now with all over social media where it's like two or three uh youtubers will do a collaboration together two or three instagrammers will do an, a collaboration together so it's like really important uh and and again that goes back to like what we started this conversation off with like how important it is to work with other people I love working by myself. I work a lot by myself, but I love working with other people because I always create my best stuff when I am in a room with other people and we're working on something together with a, a vision, common vision and common purpose. Right. And you know? they're, they're creating their best too, 99% of the time because there's somebody else there. There's yeah. Somebody to get into that flow with for well, sure. And it's also highly competitive because everybody mm -hmm. is fighting for the best idea. You know, it's like, right. Um, as much as you, you love the guy next to you, but you want to do better than him. Right. Right. <laughs> you want to make sure he's doing as good as he can possibly do, but because there are people around you, you just want to do better. You know? Yeah. You, it's like, it's like I used the, the treadmill analogy earlier, as far as being on a competitive team versus having a treadmill in your home. It's just, even just like running with somebody is an entirely different vibe than running by yourself. Cause you're going to push yourself harder because yeah. it's competitive. Like you said. Yeah. And, and I mean, when it's a, when it's a, a, a project where you're all working and you're all sharing the combined credit, a, a, a film is a great example of that. If you've got four producers on a film, it's like, I don't, if you and I are producing a film, I don't care if you scrapped 99% of my ideas and your ideas are better because 
at the end of the day, we're both standing up on the stage going, hey, this was a great film. And the audience doesn't know whose idea was whose. And all. it's a it's a team project. And if you're a team player, you're looking mm-hmm. at what are the best ideas to make sure that this pro- project, song, film, book, video, whatever it is, how can we make this absolutely the greatest thing we've ever created? And then the minute that it's finished, how can we turn around and try to beat that? I mean, that is like the, that is the, in my opinion, that's the, that is the creative life summed up in a sentence. How can I do my best work with the people around me, comma, how can I finish it and do something better the next time? You know, like that's and, and it. Just keep, keep repeating, the, you know, wash, rinse, repeat. Just keep doing that over and over again and you'll have a legacy. Yeah. 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 That's what it comes down to. Yeah. Um, I think we're, we're going to have to call it here yep. for, for time's sake. Thank you for coming on, Sean. This was actually a really great conversation. The time kind of, kind of flew by on me. Yeah. Sorry about that. No, it's all, it's all good. <laughs> I've, I've enjoyed this. I feel like I've learned a lot. I feel like um, our listeners will find a lot of value in what you've had to share. I've, I've learned a lot mostly about um, the psychology of, of creativity and collaboration, I think not in a, in a technical or scientific sense, but um, in almost an inspirational sense, if that makes sense. Yeah. I love what you're doing, Sean. I'm really excited to see how the Kickstarter goes, the studio, the documentary, the accompanying podcast. Uh, if any of you guys, you listeners out there are interested in what Sean is doing, there will be a link in the description. Um, is it, is it a link to the, uh, is it just information about the project? Well, right now, uh, because we're like right at the, the beginning stages of this whole thing. Um, we've mm-hmm. shot a bunch of footage already, but we're just now getting like into the meat of producing the documentary. Uh, the best thing that people can do is go to the link that you're going to put up on the, up on the description and sign up for essentially like notifications and all that, because as we get a little bit further, the, those tools are going to become, more advanced of like what we're actually you know there'll be video and and all right. of that but the most simple thing right now is just sign up so we get your email and can keep everybody updated because i think it's okay. like we're talking about this stuff and the the studio and i mean there's a lot of information and i think people are it's it's just a great topic you know it's relevant no matter if you're into music or any of the creative arts it's it's relevant Absolutely. I will absolutely be signing up for the, is it a mailing list? Is it email? Uh, it is right now. It's just going to be a mailing list. And like I said, okay. that'll develop as we go. Right. Very cool. Send me links in the future uh, when the Kickstarter launches and all that jazz. And I'll add those links to the description. As oh, well. awesome. We'll have direct awesome. access to that. Well, I totally appreciate this, man. It was a, uh, it was a fun hour. It flew by and thank you so much for having me. Thanks for coming on, man. I'd love to have you on again sometime as the project progresses. For sure, dude. All right, sweet. Have a good one. You too.